Losing eyesight, but... The longer you can look back, the farther you can look forward. Good afternoon, good morning, hello, wherever you are. We are approaching the last step on our historical journey on technology and diplomacy. It's a great moment. It has been journey which has been lasting for uh, last 11 months. And the Churchill uh, words, the longer you can look back, the farther you can look forward, are probably the best summary of what we will discuss today. Back in January, we started our journey uh, with this quote that inspired uh, our discussion. And we will symbolically end uh, with it uh, as a perfect synthesis of uh, our journey. It was not always about past. It was always about future. During the last 11 months, we tried to find guidelines for the future of diplomacy by revisiting its history. And what we learned, the core functions of diplomacy, such as negotiation and representation, have been present since the very, very early days of diplomacy or attempts of our predecessors to solve their conflicts peacefully. Exactly these core functions have not changed substantively over the centuries. Rather, changes have occurred in how diplomacy has been performed. And here, technology has played a crucial role, starting with the appearance of language, we can call it the early communication technology via telegraph and radio and up to the internet and in our era. On this journey, uh, our aim was to discover how civilizations dealt with these new technologies, to identify common patterns throughout history, as well as the importance of the time-space context for the, the interplay between, on one hand, technology, and on the other hand, diplomacy. Experts we met on this journey help us a lot to understand different angles of interplay between technology and diplomacy. Their intervention related to synergies between these two fields and the broader context in the, which we should discuss technology and diplomacy. Let me remind you of some of the real highlights. From Professor Frank Deval, one of the world's foremost experts on primate behavior, we learn more about diplomatic practice of primates and how and when they negotiate, compromise and mediate. Therefore, some elements of diplomacy emerged even before uh, Homo sapiens. Tom Standage, deputy editor of The Economist and author of the book, A History of the World in Six Glasses, and another important book, The Victorian Internet, join us twice. We talked to Tom about the influence that drinks and beverages had uh, on diplomacy since ancient era. And he also helped us to understand better impact of invention of telegraph on geopolitics of the time and diplomacy. Professor Jonathan uh, uh, Shepard, historian, 
and uh, one of the leading scholars of the subject of Byzantine diplomacy helped us to learn more about tactics and history of this uh, fascinating uh, diplomacy, Byzantine diplomacy. And Ambassador Stefano Baldi joined us on the last stop on our journey to discuss impact of the internet and social media on diplomacy in more recent time. Before we dive into summary of discussion on the future of diplomacy, let us quickly resume the, this journey of history of diplomacy by revisiting the main stops on uh, our journey over the 11 months. We can start with the real origins of diplomacy and prehistory, which we tackled in February. We try to find the moment where diplomacy started. And we talked about a few important factors that could help us in this, the emergence of tools, trade, arts, gifts, and spoken and written language as a key tool of diplomacy. And exactly, the emergence of language and speech as the main instrument of communications was one of the most important factors in engaging and solving conflicts and probably moment when diplomacy started. It was a moment when societal organization emerged such as clans and tribes. And the first negotiation and search for compromise appear in that period. These early forms of diplomacy included the exchange of gifts between groups and tribes, then developing relations through marriages, uh, intertribal bonds, creating alliances. Another important factor for developing development of diplomacy was the emergence of tools and trade. Trade requires engaging with non-group members, negotiating and building trust, just like diplomacy has been doing throughout the history. In addition, the presence of art implied a few developments that could have set this stage for this proto-diplomacy. And they relate to our cognitive, cognitive capacity of our far, far predecessors for abstract thinking, self-awareness, and awareness of the group in which uh, these uh, people lived. This was the, let's say, stage for the proto-diplomacy. Then in March, we moved to ancient era in the Middle East. This is era for which we have more details and uh, artifacts about importance of diplomacy. We started with the emergence of writing, one of the most important communication technologies in the history of mankind and definitely in the history of diplomacy. And navigated through the rich diplomatic heritage of Mesopotamia, here we move to the uh, Akkadian language as some sort of first diplomatic language, definitely the code of Hammurabi and Mari archives, first reference of diplomatic communities and uh, some sort of early diplomatic passports. Then we move slightly to the West and the uh, Amarna diplomacy, Talamarna diplomacy in ancient Egypt. Talamarna diplomacy is or usually singled out as uh, uh, having the most developed diplomatic system among the powers at that time. Using the more or less diplomatic techniques that we use today, including sending representatives, negotiating, and handling out immunities. It is named, named a, a, a Talamarna diplomacy after Egyptian city of Tel El Amarna, established by the pharaoh Amenhotep IV, uh, later called Akhenaten, where archaeologists discovered the first diplomatic archive, so-called the Amarna letters, not verbals of that year. In that uh, part of our journey, we visited Assyria, Persia, ancient China, and India with their rich diplomatic heritage. In April, we move towards the West. We move to the ancient Greece, the cradle of modern civilization. In Greek politics, 
uh, democracy was developed through the battle of ideas and uh, also exercise of power with the aim to gain trust and support from those who vote. Therefore, democracy was the key, not necessarily diplomacy. Despite this, the idea of a common peace from ancient uh, Greek diplomacy was one of the founding pr principles of the League of Nations and the later on Charter of uh, the United Nations. Therefore, there is a line from ancient Greek, Greece till today. And that period we learn who were the Proxenos, Presbyes, and the Kerikes. We spoke about innovation like multilateral diplomacy, cryptography, and hydraulic telegraph as one of inventions of that time. We concluded that ancient Greek diplomacy was one of the most open diplomacies ever practiced. Envoys, foreign envoys address public gatherings in, in the receiving city state by using the arts of persuasion and rhetoric. Paradoxically, this very openness created one of the major weaknesses of ancient Greek diplomacy. Because often it is not easy or possible to achieve compromise, the core of negotiation and diplomacy in the public eye. This is one of important lessons that we uh, can learn from ancient Greek diplomacy and the limits of the open diplomacy when it comes to achieving delicate compromises which they needed at that time and we need today. Spring is in full swing and in May we talk about the Byzantine long, longevity and diplomacy. After the collapse of Rome, Byzantium continued the tradition of the Roman Empire, from time to time attempting to restore its glory. Without the power and the control of the Roman, all the Roman Empire, Byzantium had to revert to diplomacy to a greater extent than the, than the previous Roman Empire. Surrounded by hostile tribes from the Balkans, Asia, Middle East, Africa, it used sophisticated techniques to keep all of these tribes under control. And many of the techniques of negotiation, public diplomacy, were developed during Byzantine diplomacy. Summer is coming in June. We move further west to Renaissance Italy. Renaissance diplomacy appeared among Italian cities says, approximately in the 15th century. In this period, the first full diplomatic system was established consisting of permanent diplomatic missions, diplomatic reporting, and use of diplomatic privileges. We also talked about papal, uh, papal diplomacy and the concept of marriage diplomacy. The complexities of marriage negotiation in 16th century dynastic uh, era was at the heart of uh, foreign affairs. Another important development in this period was the invention of the printing press. Around 4040 by German Johannes Gutenberg, and this invention of printing press had a considerable impact on basically all aspects of society, including diplomacy. The church's dominance through parchment-based writing was challenged, and its participation in diplomacy gradually started to decline. Clergymen no longer had a monopoly in literacy. They were no longer an indispensable part of every diplomatic uh, mission as they were before. Let's move uh, to August. And in August, uh, we discussed two decisive developments on our journey. On one hand, the invention of a telegraph as one of the key technological tools. And on the other hand, uh, Vienna Congress of the 1814-1815. The, the Vienna Congress or Congress of Vienna laid the foundation for modern diplomacy, including the introduction of diplomatic precedent, diplomatic ranks, and the period between the Congress of Vienna, 1814-15, and the First war, uh, World War, 
approximately 100 years, is often described as the golden age of diplomacy, which managed to secure one of the most peaceful periods in the recent history. There were many wars and conflicts, but there was no global war. During this period, structural developments took place in both communication and diplomacy. Communications inventions became part of daily life, gradually becoming integrated into global telecommunication network. Diplomacy was transformed from ad hoc meetings into an organized system consisting of diplomatic services, international organizations, and uh, generally congresses, summits, and international gatherings. The most important technological invention in this period was the electrical telegraph, which for the first time in human history effectively detached communication from transportation. We analyze also during the, this session the impact of telegraph on diplomacy in three contexts, which remain underlying methodology for our analysis of interplay between technology and diplomacy. First, changes in the environment for diplomatic uh, activities. Second, introduction of new topics on diplomatic agenda. And third, use of new tools for diplomacy. In September, we moved to uh, uh, invention of telephone and wireless. The telephone, radio, and uh, telegraph constitute the three most important inventions that have shaped communication up to our era. As we this, uh, already mentioned, the telegraph delinked communication from physical transportation and traveling. The telephone transferred voice over the distance. And the radio delinked delink communication from almost any physical medium, including cables. These inventions have also strongly influenced diplomacy. For example, the telephone enabled close contact between heads of states, including uh, via the use of various types of red lines. The radio had a strong impact on communication and geopolitics. Some diplomatic issues like security, privacy, neutrality, uh, were raised in discussions surrounding exactly introduction of telephone and wireless communication. And they are still discussed today in different contexts of digital policy. Therefore, there are these long, long lines in the history of technology and diplomacy. In October, we focus on uh, radio and TV, TV broadcasting and their influence on diplomacy. The Politicians, in particular, diplomats later on understood the power of radio quite early between First and Second World War. For the first time, they could address the wider population directly via radio without having their message filtered by, let's say, traditional press. Radio was used both as a propaganda and moral boosting tool by all sides. During the Cold War and international, uh, this international broadcasting increased and contained propaganda uh, packaged as a news. Uh, communist and anti-communist states attempting to influence each other domestic population by using radio. Since its invention in 1926, television has become the main news and entertainment, entertainment medium. And countries and diplomatic, uh, diplomats, uh, diplomatic service started using TV as a quick source of information, therefore passive one, and as a powerful tool to convey their message to the foreign population. In the information age, the involvement of the media and diplomatic affairs can have really strong impact on negotiations, including discrete or secret negotiations. Even today, television is still powerful and important uh, part of diplomacy and uh, public diplomacy. It is important in shaping public opinion 
and the general public still relies on traditional TV channels as a principal source of information. And last month, month of November, we spoke about internet and social media. And we are now at the familiar ground. Diplomats use the internet for meetings, sharing information, negotiating, and communicating. And exactly social media has drastically changed what can be achieved at the negotiating table as internet users and public affect the process and outcome of negotiations, including the question of framing of the major issues, the question of uh, uh, language which is used and made that man dilemma which are basically posed in front of uh, diplomats and negotiators. This was the short, uh, let's say, summary, journey, uh, summary of our historical journey from January till November. And we will use this session and then last part of this session to see what we can learn from the past in order to address emerging issues of artificial intelligence, virtual reality, metaverse, you name it and you have it. But before we move into the future developments, let us hear from uh, Andriana if there are some comments, questions, or suggestions in the chat. Nothing so far, Jovan. Back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Andriana. Uh, we didn't mention, for those of you who are new at this session, in our journey, you can pose the question or your comment in the, in the chat box, and Andriana will bring it uh, to the... Andriana, our moderator, will bring it to our discussion. Let us now discuss, uh, going back to uh, this statement by Winston Churchill about uh, looking backwards in order to see further forward, we'll now see what is ahead of us. And we'll try to see how diplomacy and what should be role on diplomacy in this period. We are approaching another axial period where our society has to answer some fundamental question about us and future of humanity. More than 20 centuries ago, during so-called axial period, the software of our society was set with the beginning of the main religions and philosophical schools of thinking. Since then, every so often, Technology has changed and challenged humanity. Technology induced shifts in human history can be traced back to our ancestors, taming fire, starting to write, beginning to use the wheel, and more recently, inventing the printing press, the telegraph and the internet. Those changes are often described as a new epoch, paradigm change, or industrial evolution, as they trigger fundamental changes and challenges uh, and force us to venture into unknown. As humanity steps away from its comfort zone, certainly certainty ends, opportunity begins, and risks increase. Today, we are once again at a turning point. The complex and often profound impact of tech developments are felt at all levels, from matters of war and peace to lifestyle, work, individual well being, and ultimately our existence itself. The rapid acceleration in technologies such as artificial intelligence and robotics is fundamentally reshaping our notion of human rights, freedom, and human agency. Technology is revolutionizing education, improving medical care, uh, advancing uh, agricultural production, among numerous impacts on our society. The COVID-19 pandemic vividly displayed the critical relevance of digital infrastructure for modern society. 
while new digital technology unlock great potentials for our society, they simultaneously trigger new risk and socioeconomic divides. As new industries emerge, older ones are scrambling to maintain their relevance in digital era. Jobs are disappearing in fading industries. Social security and support system are under a lot of pressure. From the militarization of cyberspace to competition for AI dominance, a new geostrategical race is in the making. In addition, the internet amplifies existing problems and risks. Criminal activities existed well before the advent of technology. Yet, criminal acts have become much more dangerous through the exploitation of vulnerabilities in our interdependent networks and services. Disinformation, also known as fake news, is as old as humanity. Yet, social media platforms broadcast such content faster and more pervasively than ever thought imaginable, undermining trust in public information and science and inflicting a great cost on our society. Like all new technologies that we explore, digital technology creates winners and losers. And never before in history have, for example, companies had such economic social, and one can say even cognitive power. In just span of a few decades, China's Shenzhen evolved from a small fishing village into vibrant global technology hub. San Francisco's Bay Area has become the center of economic dynamism in the United States and home to the world's largest concentration of investment and innovation. Nearly one third of the world's billionaires made their fortune in the tech sector. However, many have not been as fortunate and they relate to individuals, social groups and countries that lost something as a result of digital transformation. The tech transition has led to uh, what we can call lost generation of people who are too old to adopt, adopt new technology and too young for retirement. And the widening gap between the winners and losers of digital technology is tearing apart the social fabric and triggering new conflicts and instabilities worldwide. At this turning point, humanity is not prepared to respond to digital change on, or even to properly digest, analyze, and fully understand its implications. The digital future is being shaped in an ad hoc manner, often unilaterally by mainly tech sector actors, while countries and citizens largely remain on the sidelines. Thus, the need, the need for an informed, inclusive, and impactful social response to tech developments is, a, is of the utmost urgency. In addition, today's policy decisions on technology are not only about us. They will also fundamentally impact future generations. Their rights should be protected as suggested by the UN Secretary General, General in his recent report, Our Common Agenda. Our generation, should pass to the next, a rich heritage that we received from previous generations. And future generations need to be able to make decisions that are informed by their time and interests. Passing our shared heritage to the next epoch is the public responsibility of us and our generation. This includes preventing the privatization of our common knowledge through, for example, AI-driven codification made by leading tech companies. While it is difficult to grasp and predict future, future of AI and digital developments, 
we must nevertheless prepare to deal with them. The first step will be to empower individuals, institutions to understand the impact of technology on society and to make the policy choices inform policy cho choices ahead of us. And our choices are not made in, in a void. They're shaped by institution, political, social, and cultural dynamics. Companies are motivated by the bottom line, their imperative to make a profit and provide services for society. Governments are guided by their core responsibility to preserve the rule of law, public order, and to maintain healthy economic, political, and social system. Civil society strives to protect the interests and rights of the individuals and communities through awareness building and advocacy. Again, this backdrop, there will be need for much more effective diplomacy and uh, in policy making along three main aspects. First, we will need more diplomacy than ever before, since in highly interdependent world, military solutions could be very damaging for all involved, including those who may have a stronger military power. Supply lines, economic flows, digital connection could be destroyed by military force with enormous impact on humanity. Thus, diplomacy as a way of solving conflicts by using peaceful means is becoming more important than ever in human history. But second point, diplomacy will be performed differently. It will require much more bottom-up approach, information and involvement of new actors. And third points are new actors. New actors from businesses, civil society, governments, religious community will have to be involved more in policy making and modern diplomacy. It will make modern diplomacy not only more inclusive, but more informed and ultimately more impactful because agreements and deals that were made will be owned by wider community than just, uh, let's say, diplomatic services and uh, member states. Therefore, these are three aspects of the major impact uh, of the current developments and future diplomacy. Interdependence and diplomacy is a key tool for dealing with interdependence. Second, new ways of doing diplomacy. And third, new actors, uh, which should join diplomatic negotiation and overall processes. It is important to uh, highlight that as we are shifting in that era, there should be utmost clarity of the roles and responsibilities of each actors, including their legitimacy and including their relevance to the global public good and global public interest. I invite you to continue our journey on uh, revisiting old aspects of diplomacy and discovering new ways of conducting future uh, of diplomacy, new ways of dealing with cons uh, conflicts and what is most important, enabling prosperity for us and generations that will come after us. We will be now uh, on our uh, journey. We will be basically uh, hearing first from uh, from Andriana, and then uh, we will have the some sort of a small party for the last leg of our journey. Andriana, first over to you. Uh, thank you for the floor, Jovan. I do have a question, a sub question, and another question. I'll start with question number one. Uh, would you agree uh, on key shifts in technology that the mega shifts were the agricultural, the industrial, and now the information revolution? And a question that's related to that, both are from Richard Hill, is 
uh, would you agree that these are the key events of those revolutions? For the agricultural revolution, how to allocate the value added derived from land? Uh, for the industrial revolution, how to allocate the value added derived from intellectual property, in particular inventions? And for the information revolution, uh, the key events should be how to allocate the value added derived from aggregation of individual data. And there is a question from Carla de Moore, which uh, says, do you think that diplomacy as we know it today is possible in the metaverse world? Back to you, Johan. Thank you. Thank you, Andriana. Uh, ex excellent questions. I uh, would uh, ans answer that, uh, yes, the mode of production, agricultural society, as Richard indicated, industrial and this information society have been uh, defining moments when our far predecessors settled and started the cultivating land, they had to protect the land. They get clearer uh, uh, perception of property and having the, to protect their space from other spaces. And probably at one of those moments, some conflict started appearing. Although we very often focus in international relations theory on conflicts, those societies cooperated a lot. There was an element that climate changes throughout the history and the small, uh, small uh, sort of uh, ice age and other periods also impacted uh, uh, available resources and people started fighting for limited land uh, and other, other resources. Therefore, the answer in short is yes, it, uh, all of these changes impacted the society as a whole and diplomacy as a way of solving conflicts in agricultural era, in Mesopotamia, ancient Egypt, uh, uh, Assyria, uh, then in industrial era, I would say that intellectual property in addition to, to also access to raw materials, industrial products, but legally speaking, it was intellectual property. And probably in this long journey, we come to our era and the question of access to data and uh, artificial intelligence in, in particular, basically data as a passive aspect and artificial intelligence as a way to detect the patterns in data and uh, potentially privatize the patterns how our society functions. Therefore, the patterns how we interact with our family, our uh, surrounding uh, with uh, huge potentials, uh, potential risks. And this is why I started today's presentation as a sort of a axial uh, period, axial period by German philosopher Karl Jasper was called period between eighth century BC till uh, Anno Domino, where most of the software of modern society was set. Um, Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism, Zoroastrianism, uh, ancient uh, philosophy, way of thinking about who we are and uh, how we deal with some of the pressing issues of human life, like uh, death, happiness, purpose. And still today, people say that all philosophy uh, is basically just a footnote on the Plato's uh, and Aristotle writings. And that's, that's true, especially when we discuss ethics and many issues, we have really to undust ancient thinkers. Therefore, that was the important period. And then we had the enlightenment as a new revisiting of centrality of human rationality. And fast forward, we had, uh, let's say, Vienna School of Thinkers with uh, uh, Freud, with uh, Schumpeter, with uh, von Mise, with Hayek, uh, and, uh, and uh, Wittgenstein, who shaped the software for our era. Therefore, what we are now facing, we, are, we have to rethink some of these issues as Richard, Richard mentioned. And we have to rethink also by revisiting some of those historical thinkings. Definitely Vienna thinkers who have the most direct impact on our society currently, then enlightenment thinkers, and then axial period of the, let's say 20 plus centuries ago. In that context, I would say even that aspect in addition to agricultural, industrial, informational, could be combined in, in our thinking about what we are going to do ahead of us. And the second question is on the metaverse and the future of diplomacy. My uh, sort of take on it is that uh, 
uh, there will be always core aspect of diplomacy and it hasn't changed throughout the history. Peaceful resolution of conflicts, representation of communities, whether it is small tribe or country, like China of 1.5 billion people, but there is a question of representation, diplomats or envoys or call it uh, whatever way you want, are representing interests of some people. Therefore, those two aspects, negotiating and compromise and representing interests will exist as long as we as exist in humans. This is one aspect and it won't change. The second aspect is uh, related to tools that we use, including AI, including social media, including metaverse. One potential shift could relate to the role of humans in society. If we lose central role that we have been having for well, 10,000 years plus, if it became less relevant and if uh, our free will is hacked as some people argue with artificial intelligence, then the role of diplomacy may change substantively because it won't negotiate conflicts among humans anymore and it won't represent humans anymore. And there's some thinking about transhumanism and the uh, uh, emergence of the robots, which are currently science fiction. Could, that development could shift the relevance of diplomacy, but it won't be only diplomacy. It will be basically future of humanity that we know. That would be all from my side, but let's, let's move from these heavy topics to, 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 uh, to small party. Arvin. The journey via drinks. We will end up every session with a typical uh, drink of that era. I have a red wine here and I have some water and I'm sure that uh, my French uh, and Italian friends will be horrified. I will put just, just a bit. Smell and bouquet is basically diluted, but um, um, great cheers from uh, Geneva. We always have some beverage. For today, it is coffee. Coffee is the world's third most consumed beverage. It's afternoon in uh, Geneva, and one needs to regain a bit of energy. Aqua Vitae, a strong spirit distilled from wine. Nicely labeled, the brandy of our brandy of our historical historical journey. Cheers. It's not bad. Absinthe, the drink of the so-called Belle Epoque. I was taught by experts how to do it. Oh, it's quite strong. We will have a drink. Today the drink is a champagne. As you know, champagne is used a lot in diplomacy. I will uh, probably use this tulip, which nowadays prevail. Cheers. And the drink of the Byzantine Empire was wine. Katerina, I would like to invite you if we have a glass of wine. I don't know for other participants, I invite you as well. Thank you. I'll take a few steps. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. I would like to cheer you with the martini. The popularity of martini rocked with Jan Fleming's story of the secret agent, James Bond. Therefore, for this point, I was asked to wear James Bond glasses. And uh, uh, with these James Bond glasses, I would like to cheer you. Cheers with the uh, martini. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you, Arvin, uh, for this great compilation. Um, um, after th this summary, but it was for the whole year, I can sound as a person who is candidate to go to the center for the rehab rehabilitation from alcoholism. I don't mind having here and there a good, uh, good drink. Uh, but uh, for sobriety, I dis decided to conclude uh, this journey with a glass of water, uh, all good uh, aqua, and to thank uh, all people who made this journey possible. Definitely my colleague Mina Mudric, who was behind the organization and making sure that we are on time. 
uh, Andriana, who moderated the uh, session, Arvin, uh, Fire, who were uh, making sure that uh, uh, everything on technological side has been functioning well. Uh, Katarina, um, uh, who would, uh, with whom I drank the red wine, you saw her. Uh, here in Geneva, when I'm connecting uh, from um, uh, Marco and Cecile, who have uh, been uh, fantastic in arranging the setup for our session. And uh, for all of you, it was a great journey, uh, very inspirational. We will continue in some form our future di discussion along this simple line and simple question. What we can learn from the past in order to address challenges of the future. With that, uh, I wish you Merry Christmas, smooth passage to the next uh, year, and a lot of happiness, good health, and prosperity in 2022. We shall bring you further news as quickly as we